1 Samuel chapter 15, and I'm not going to read, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but starting in verse number 11, the whole chapter is dealing with Saul and his disobedience when he came to the Amalekites. And uh, in verse number 11, the Lord is talking to Samuel. And in verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 11, he said, It repenteth me that I have set up king Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me, and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord. And when Samuel uh, uh, rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel. Behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel said to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey, saying, Go, utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, fight against them till they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? But didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, verse 22, Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. We have the sad decline, the sad fall of King Saul. King Saul, very briefly, we're introduced to as the people have been beckoning for a king. They've been crying out for a king. All the other countries around them have a king. They've been led by the prophet, uh, by some judges in the past in particular, uh, more recently by the judge uh, and, and prophet Samuel. But they've been crying out for a king. They want a king. They want that symbol of authority and leadership. That wasn't God's plan. And Samuel had given them the, um, uh, all the information of what would entail and what, would it, what they would encounter if they had a king. Uh, one of them, not surprising to you and me, would be taxation. They hadn't had that before, but they would be heavily taxed and their people would be taken, their young men would be taken uh, to, to, to build an army. And all these things they hadn't dealt with before would become part of the routine if they got a king. But the people said, we don't care. We want a king. Give us a king. And God in his sovereignty didn't just step away from the situation. God stayed very involved in the situation. And God led the prophet Samuel to Saul. And he picked Saul, Saul who was a man who was very, very humble. That's the word we would all pick when we talk about the early stages of Saul. He was very humble. He didn't think he was worthy of that. Uh, he was a, a strapping guy, a big guy, a tall. In fact, the Bible says he stood head and shoulders above the others. He was a big guy. He was one to look to for leadership because of his, his size, because of his skill set, uh, because of his military abilities and stuff. But he was a very humble guy. He didn't think a lot of himself. In fact, when they went to find him, to anoint him, he was hiding, wasn't he? God had to tell them where he was so they could go roost him out of where he was hiding to bring him forth to anoint him. So he was a very humble guy. He didn't look at himself in a, in a, um, in a high way or a lifted up way. But as we come to chapter 15 later in his life, Samuel uh, is, is, is being warned of God of the sin of Saul. And Saul has become overwrought or overridden with his authority. And I think we would all agree the word we would have to use to describe Saul at this point in his life is now pride. And he's done a complete 180 here. 
The man who started out with such humility has now been tripped up and he's going to be removed and his family will not be able to continue in their reign as future kings all because of his pride. Pride got him. He disobeyed, decided to sacrifice and, and uh, uh, in, in the place of Samuel earlier. He didn't follow through in the full command of God. He thought he knew better in the situation and redid God's rules a little bit to meet what the people wanted. He continued to argue with Samuel. I know I jumped down through the passage a little bit, but if you remember, he, he argued with Samuel. Yeah, I did everything God said. Yeah. No, you didn't. <laughs> you didn't follow through the commands. You didn't do what you were told to do. You, you twisted things around. Because of that, your obedience and lack, or I'm sorry, lack of obedience, your disobedience, is going to remove you from being the king. And we're going to see Saul not, not turn from that, not repent from that, not change his ways. In fact, the rest of Saul's story continues to go downward, doesn't it? The rest of Saul's story, he becomes more angry and more bitter he becomes more vaulted in pride. After this is the story of David entering the picture and Saul trying to kill David and hunt him down. He twice throws the javelin at him while David's playing the harp and David's playing the harp to try to calm his evil spirit. And it's just, I mean, one thing after another, nothing else that we read about Saul is good. It's just a downward spiral. As he replaced the humility that he started with, with pride, later in his life. The things that were to be valued in his life by God were the things that he let slip away. God didn't even want him to have a king, but he let him have a king and he led him to a man who was in humility, who, who was a humble guy. He had the things the people were looking for, but God knew the heart of the man, and he was a humble guy, and God allowed him to be the first king. Saul would be the first king. Samuel would anoint him the first king. Why? Because he started out with the right heart. But Saul let it fade away. He let it go. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 reminds us we have to give the more earnest heed, lest at any time we let them slip. I don't think that it's only possible that we as human beings and Christians let things slip. I think it's probable that we let things slip. I, I just think it's our human nature. We let things start to slide. We let things start to go. We let things start to fade away. There's things in our, in our life as, as Christians or as um, as, as, as a church, that we begin to just start to get soft on. And we've seen that in the past. We can look at the past and see that. I was born into a denomination that at one time preached the gospel. This church, Cedar Hill Baptist Church, we're getting ready in, in January here. We're going to be taking a year celebrating our 40th anniversary. 40 years of ministry. 40 years ago, though, this church started out of that same denomination. A denomination that began to let things slip away. You know, began to let things slide. It began to get soft on, on standards. To the point that a group of people pulled out of that denomination and started Cedar Hill Baptist Church, started this ministry. For that same reason, you know, a hundred miles away, my parents left that same denomination and started a church because their old denomination had let things slip, let things go, let things slide. Things that, that were standards and principles and doctrines of the church for years, they let them slide. And so, I think it befalls the pastor of Cedar Hill Baptist Church. I think it's my responsibility as pastor to occasionally remind us, we can't let, there's some things we can't let slide. 
We can't let slip away. Else we become as, as others in the past who have gone down a road where the standards we had, the principles and the doctrines we stood, we've sidetracked, we've put on a back burner, and we become as churches in the past, as denominations in the past, we become lukewarm or cold and dead. And so I want to, just a reminder, I wrote down five things today. Five things today we cannot let slip away. And the first one's not going to surprise you one bit. I would hope each and every one of you that know me, that go to church here, if we talk about the very first thing we cannot slide away, the first thing we cannot change our stand on, the first thing we cannot ever start to compromise on, it's our stand on the Word of God. This, we are a Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church. We cannot begin in any way to compromise our stand on the Word of God. We cannot begin to water down our stand on the Word of God. If we look at past denominations, uh, just I, I could, we could get into weeks of discussion, but let me boil it down to this. I think most of those denominations have and still do adhere to the principle that the Word of God was inspired by God. Nobody disagrees with that. The problem is we believe that God preserved His Word for us today. We believe, we, we believe that we can pick up the Word of God and read it with the authority knowing that God's preserved it for us. It still has God's power. It still has God's authority. It was inspired in its original and preserved for you and me today. I have a number of verses, but don't turn there. Isaiah 40, verse 8. My word shall not pass away. And so God's word has been contained for us and preserved for us. The problem is we begin to, as people, as denominations, as churches, we begin to take out what we don't like. Right? We begin to question things. We begin to remove things. We begin to put certain things in certain time periods. Like, oh, that was from a different generation. or That doesn't apply to us today. Or this wasn't for us. And we begin to dissect and move things around until we boil it down. And, uh, well, in, in high school or, or college, we would have had uh, uh, cliff notes, right? If you didn't want to read the whole book that you were assigned to read for a book report, you got the cliff notes to get the general idea. And I do think that American churches today just want the cliff notes. You know? We want to boil it down to just some essential things that are important, and we'll just take out all the rest of it. No. Every word has been preserved by God for us. Every word, every verse, every passage. The word of God we must never compromise on. Uh, we must always stand true on the word of God. We must teach it to our children and teach it to our young people. Uh, we try to have a consistent theme in all of our curriculum. We've been talking about that again. We evaluate that all, all the time. But our curriculum from Sunday school to junior church curriculum to truth trackers and youth group, try to have a consistent theme of teaching the word of God. We are not here to teach you to be good citizens, uh, uh, good, uh, uh, have a good marriage, uh, how to have a good business. All those things are sub of our relationship with God. If our relationship with God and our stand on the Bible is where it needs to be, then we will become the citizens we should be, the spouses we should be, the parents we should be, the employees we should be. Those are secondary. So we're not here to tell you how to be a good person. We're telling you how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And how to have a relationship with him. And this Bible tells us how to do that. The word of God, we, I say all the time, and I, I've quoted it from, from other preachers in the past. We open the word of God, we're opening the mind of God. And when we open the word of God, we see what God Almighty has for you and me today. Jesus Christ is the word. The word made flesh among us. He is the word. When we open the word of God, we understand what God wants for us. So the word of God remains our standard. So number one, when we talk about things we're not going to let slip, we can't let slip. Boy, I, as long as I'm breathing, I hope and pray that the word of God is preeminent in the preaching and teaching 
in the work that we do and the services we have at Cedar Hill Baptist Church. We cannot let the word of God slip away. Number two, I wrote down standards, our standards. Uh, we have standards that are different from a lot of other churches. I understand that. We are traditional in our worship. And while that's not the most important thing, there's a reason that we do that. And we want to honor God. We don't want to honor man. We don't want to have an entertainment venue. We want to uh, continue to worship God in a way that we hope and trust elevates God, elevates God in our worship. But with that, we want to be separated from sin. And that may be where churches are challenged today more than ever. Uh, instead of letting sin in, we, we want to have a stand against sin. Uh, spend a number of what, Sunday school lesson this morning. So often, uh, as Brother Walker's teaching, uh, things jump out that have to do with my message. Brother Walker this morning talked about the battle at Ai. Israelites lost the battle of Ai. Why? Because there was sin in the camp. And when they dealt with sin, then they had victory again. God hates sin, God has no tolerance for sin. God, God, God wants nothing to do with sin. And we need to have a continued separated stand from sin. There's times we're going to, and I, Desi and I talked about this, uh, this this past week on a number of different things. There's times that we may need to change our, our methods, but we never change our standards or principles. I think churches have a hard time sometimes deciding what to change and what not to change. Right? We may change the way we do things, but we can never change what we preach and what we stand and what we believe and what our mission is. Those things don't change. Uh, you know, whether you know, technology has changed things, no doubt. Right, We do, do things a little different than we used to with technology. We spent a year now putting uh, my messages on YouTube. We didn't do that a year ago, but we have this past year. That's something new. That's something new that we're able to do and incorporate and reach more folks. It's just something new. A method has changed. The way we do it, the order of things uh, might, might be different than it used to be. It's okay to change things like that. We don't change some of those things. We, we become archaic in the way we do things. But our principles, our standards, uh, uh, so often when churches begin to change, they begin to change their principles. They begin to change what they're preaching about, what they're preaching against, what they're preaching for, and what their stand may be. We must never change our standards, the things that we believe. We're going to get to that in more detail in just a minute. Now, I wrote down number three, and this is one I, I didn't have on my list seven years ago when I preached this message. But it's one that is, has been heightened, I think, in our church and in our culture more than ever. And that is, we must never let slip away the family, the family unit, our marriages, raising our children. How many times have we been affected by this in our, in our, in our families in general, in families in our church? Satan is after your family. He wants to bust up marriages. He wants your kids rebelling. He wants there to be separation and problems. Satan Satan loves it when the Christmas dinner is full of stress and tension. You know? Think about that. We get together to celebrate Christmas to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. I think Satan gets a kick out of it if he can get people together to celebrate Jesus' birth and have them start fighting and arguing. I think Satan gets a kick out of that. Because he wants to bust up marriages. He wants to bring along temptation. He wants people falling into temptation. Satan wants you to just give up on training those kids and teaching those kids and guiding. You know what? That's not easy, is it? It's not easy teaching children. It's not easy training children. It's not easy. You got to do it over and over and over and over and over again. You know, we spend a lot of time with that with our grandkids and, and trying to help help raise our grandkids alongside, of course, their, their mom and dad. But they spend you know, so many hours at our house during the day. We want that not to be a downtime. We want that to be a help to mom and dad. And so we enforce rules. 
You know, no. Well, they argue with you, right? No, you can't do that. Parents are so quick to give in because it's easier. It's not easy disciplining your kids. It's not easy having yes and no's for your kids that you stick to. It's not easy following through for your kids. Have a marriages ending, relationships ending. I've seen it in my neighborhood recently. I've seen it in family recently. People splitting up, people, people getting tired. People, I, I think the, the, the word that, that's so used so often today, I hear it even in my own marriage counseling. Um, it's uh, a pastor, I've fallen, fallen out of love. Fallen out of love. Just side note, but it's a good thing Jesus doesn't fall out of love with us, right? It's a good thing we don't have to worry about that when it comes from Jesus, our direction. And if that's our example, then it probably should work the other way too when it comes to our relationship with our spouse, of course. Our marriages, we cannot let them, cannot let them slip away. Raising our children, we cannot let them. Satan's after us. He wants to attack us. Listen, there are, there are people in our church, there are people that are not in our ministry this year that were here last year and left because their marriage dissolved. Because they gave up on marriage, gave up on their family. I wrote down number four. You know what we can't let slip away? The Great Commission. <laughs> Acts 1 8. I'm going to turn to that when I. I've wrote down verses on these and I've, I've, I've neglected to turn to some of them. I apologize. But Acts 1 8. Familiar verse. The words going out. It's, I'm sure it's in red in your Bible. The Lord is commissioning his, his disciples just before he leaves. And he says in verse number 8, he's telling them of, of the coming of the Holy Spirit, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. All right, then what are they supposed to do with that? Ye shall be witnesses un, unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We must never, ever slip away on giving the gospel out to those we come in contact with. Witnessing individually to those that we meet. Preaching the gospel as far as a church ministry goes. Preaching the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ at events that we have. Teaching and preaching the gospel in Sunday school and junior church and vacation Bible school. Easter egg hunts and every little thing that we have that someone might come to that has never heard the gospel before. We must be busy and consistent in preaching the gospel to those that come our way. We only have so much time. We don't know when he's coming back. By the way, that's going to be my next point. We don't know when he's coming back. We don't know how much time we have. We must be busy preaching the gospel. We must be supporting missions. We must be. So many, listen, it, here's something, just a big picture, all right? Our large evangelical churches today, their missions budget is going to benevolence needs. It's going to social gospel needs, folks. People, the, the big churches today are not supporting the gospel going out. They're supporting the soup kitchen. If we can use the soup kitchen to preach the gospel, fantastic. But if we're giving them a bowl of soup and not giving them the gospel, we are sending them to hell on a full stomach. It's not doing a lick of good. It's very temporal in its help, and it's, there's no eternalness to the help. We have got to be given the gospel out in these situations. And I'm convinced that one of the things that Cedar Hill Baptist Church is doing right and continues to do right is we're supporting missionaries that are giving the gospel. First and foremost, they're giving the gospel. Do they have alternate means and methods of trying to do that? A hundred percent, yes. You know, I like to talk about uh, our missionary Tom Latham in Brazil. Tom Latham, who has a, a history as a young person of learning to wrestle, 
high school wrestling. Went to Brazil where they don't know anything about United States high school wrestling. They don't know anything about that, but they want to. So he goes into the high school for free and teaches them high school wrestling. And he says, I will do this as much as you want, but when I'm done, I'm going to give them a gospel message. And the school's like, yeah, we don't care what you say. Just teach them wrestling. And he's preaching the gospel at every wrestling match, right? So what's the purpose? It's not, his, his purpose is not to teach Brazilians wrestling. His purpose is to introduce them to Jesus Christ. But wrestling allows him an opportunity to do that. If he was down there just teaching wrestling, it would be a very temporal thing. It would be a very short-term thing. It would be a very, very uh, 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 non, uh, non-eternal event. But he's preaching the gospel and seeing people get saved. Listen, I, I think it's important that at Cedar Hill Baptist Church, our emphasis is always towards the Great Commission towards seeing the gospel go forth, whether it's through our missionaries, through our own programs, or in our individual daily life, that we're giving the gospel to people. That's why your pastor and the staff here at Cedar Baptist Church work on tracks. You know, we don't let our track rack get neglected. It is always full of new stuff. We put a lot of time and resources into that. Why? Because I believe it's your church's responsibility to give you whatever tools you need to give the gospel to someone. And so whether it's the done booklets or whether it's the track rack or all the different things we have, we want to help you get the tools necessary to share the gospel with people. We can never get away from that. We stop preaching the gospel. Listen, we stop preaching the gospel, then Cedar Hill Baptist Church becomes a country club. We just become a place where we sit and and tell each other what a nice dress you got on. I like your tie. Let's have dinner and play golf, you know. And so many churches have gone down that road. So listen, listen, here. It's the very last Sunday of 2019. It's the last Sunday of the year. It's the last Sunday of the decade. We're going to start a new one January of this year. And so your pastor is is not preaching a feel-good message Your pastor is preaching a message. Listen, don't let some things slip away. Let's not go down the road that others have gone down. Let's not do that. Let's stay the course. Let's preach the gospel. Let's keep our stand on the word of God. Let's continue to try to reach our community and be a lighthouse. Let's keep our marriages and families intact. It's not easy. None of these things are easy. This is the struggle we're against because Satan is attacking it, because our culture is dragging and pulling and pulling all the different ways against it. These are the challenges that we're up against. Last of all, and I alluded to this already, John 14. John 14, some of my favorite verses. John 14, I'm going to start reading if you want to turn there. You are welcome to do so. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now notice verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Here's Jesus Christ. We've spent this entire week, the decorations are still up. We spent this entire week remembering the fact that God Almighty became man to dwell among us. He came and was born in that little stable in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. The promise was there that that would happen, and indeed it happened. And that same Jesus, as he grew up, before he left... He told his disciples, don't be upset, don't be troubled, I'm going to prepare a place, and I, listen, I will come again. I came one time, I'm coming back. You know what we're not going to let slip away? That we are awaiting Jesus coming back. He's coming back. And while I really believe that most of the world doesn't believe that, And half the churches are wishy-washy on that. And while I believe most of the world is in darkness, just like they were the first time, the bottom line is, 
he's coming back. And I hope and pray that there's a little Baptist church in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania that won't be surprised at all when the trumpet blows. That won't be surprised at all when the archangel calls and Jesus comes back. I really believe it could happen at any time. In this year, 40th year of Cedar Hill Baptist Church, I imagine the very first pastor of Cedar Hill Baptist Church probably believed Jesus was coming back soon. You know, it's been 40 years. I, I've said all my life, I believe Jesus will come back in my lifetime. I think he will. I think he's coming back in my lifetime. I'm going to turn 50 this year. Church will turn 40. I'm going to turn 50. I, I understand I'm getting older. But I believe more than ever that he'll come back before I draw my last breath. He's coming back. He promised he's coming back. The world's waxing worse and worse and worse. There's nothing keeping him from coming back. We look at the news. We can look at the news in two ways, folks, as we go into this new decade. We can look at the news and go, oh, my goodness. Look how horrible things are. They are. Or we can look at it and say, oh, my. Jesus must be coming back soon. <laughs> he's got to be coming back soon. Look how messed up things are getting. And I tend to want to look at it that way. I think that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to have our lamps trimmed and burning bright, expecting him to come back. That's something we're not going to let slip away. I'm going to keep preaching it. I'm going to keep believing it. I'm going to keep looking for it. Very few, by the time he came the first time, there were very few that were expecting it. I want to be part of the few. That when he comes back again, be like, Lord, I was ready. I was waiting. I was looking at the Bible tells us that there's a special crown, a special crown and reward for those who are expecting his return. Let's be eligible for that crown. How about that? Let's pray.